Hey everyone, and welcome to the Sasquatch Theory Podcast. In this episode, we have James from Michigan, and he is a Bigfoot researcher. He wanted to share his encounters and experiences with all of us, and he has some really interesting things to talk about regarding the cryptid phenomenon. You can find his research on michiganaboriginal.com. James believes you can find their sign around highways, train tracks, waterways, and even power lines. I tend to agree with James, and it seems like they will leave sign around hiking trails, power line strips, and even parking lots. It seems like you find this stuff in the most random areas. It is typical for researchers to look deep in the woods and in huge forests for Bigfoot sign and activity, but you just never really know where they are going to be at. Sometimes Bigfoot activity occurs in the strangest places. It could be on someone's farm, behind someone's house, and there could even be activity in a suburb area as long as there is woods nearby. All right, guys, let's dive into our next Sasquatch Theory podcast from the state of Michigan. All right, James, welcome to Sasquatch Theory. How are you doing today? Thank you, Miguel. I'm doing great. It's a sunny day around Detroit. So, uh, yeah, I'm glad to, glad to be here, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to reach your audience. Yeah, absolutely. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. James, you sent me some files of audio that you've captured on your, I think it was on your YouTube channel. If you would, tell me a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and how you got into all this. Okay. Uh, well, uh, where I'm from, originally from Dayton, Ohio, which is uh, around the glacial moraines uh, of southern Ohio. It's full of creeks and rivers and, and such. And I was, uh, I, I was born to three sisters. Um, or two, born to two and had another one following me. So uh, every chance I got around the household, I'd, I'd run down to the creek and, uh, and uh, just, you know, be one and explore. I'd love to explore and search for salamanders and crawdads and whatever adventure I could mess up, you know, you know make up. I'd make my own bows and arrows. And uh, my, my childhood as, a, as a, the only boy in the family was uh, uh, full of adventure, often expressed through uh, uh, the cellular heroes like, you know, Daniel Boone, Davy Crockett, and, and um, Clint Eastwood, you know, those guys that lived a life of adventure. I, I love it. I, I feel as if I were made for it. So, you know, as a curious boy, I, um, the Patterson Gimlin film was uh, brought to my attention, and I thought it was always curious. I, it's, I knew there was there were two sides of the story, at least how it was presented on television. You know, some say it's a hoax, others not. Uh, I never thought one way or the other. I, I had no reason to doubt it. So uh, uh, I thought, though, as a young man, that uh, if they did exist, I wanted to see one. And it turns out in my later years, I found out that they do, in fact, exist, not by an encounter or anything, although I had some really odd experiences in the woods, which we'll get into in a little bit. Um, but uh, later on, I found out they were real. I was uh, camping and fishing in a place that seemed ideal. Um, uh, habitat or territory to, to investigate this phenomenon. Uh, so I really didn't change my cadence and go to the woods. I go, uh, as an adult, I, I, I've been going twice a year, early May and late, late fall, uh, late, late October. And, um, you know, I, I was doing the fishing. I, I'm, an, I'm an angling artist. So I was doing my angling art. Um, and I kind of burn out on all that. So when I found out this phenomenon was real and I, you know, for a lifetime, I thought that they were, I wanted to see one. I just set my eyes to the hills and, um, and learned a lot from others. Uh, I don't know if you know the name Nathan Rio. It's a pseudonym. Nathan is his first name, but learned a lot from him regarding stick structures, uh, likely habitats, what to look for, learn, learn about things like the military crest, uh, places where, um, uh, strategically with the places that offer the most uh, uh, concealment and coverage for, for these uh, crypt, cryptic beings. Um, yeah, I learned a lot about that and I just kind of changed my um, uh, focus on things that I had other without otherwise have overlooked, you know, uh, during my time in the woods. So uh, that's where it got me in trouble, man. I love the subject. I went down the rabbit hole and threatened a few relationships and, and I know that uh, I've, uh, you know, 
it, it stresses relationships. I don't recommend anybody anybody going down the rabbit hole. But I knew what I I knew, and, and by my own wits and reckoning, I I knew it was a real phenomenon, and I wanted to have that experience of laying my eyes on one of these beings. And and what I've uh, in my my thinking of, uh, regarding this phenomenon, I used to think that the uh, North American Wood Ape Conservancy had something going on. It had to be some sort of reclusive ape. Uh, until a few years into my uh, looking around, poking around their neighborhood, I, I started recording and I recorded speech, and it, which was mind blowing. Um, and I, you know, I kind of knew that they spoke given Ron Moorhead's work in the Sierra Sounds, uh, but I had no idea, I had no idea the extent uh, to which they do speak and they do communicate. and. And um, I've had, I have enough audio recordings that has led me to believe that they're an ancient people. They speak an ancient language. They do utter uh, English words. Um, and they also have other vocal modalities uh, that um, not only employ conventional speech as we understand it, but other vocal modalities that enable them to speak within the sounds of nature. Uh, and it's a big pill to swallow, but that's essentially what they do. They can speak within the sound of the rain. Or the wind, and I've got audio recordings that, uh, you know, unbeknownst to me at the time, even though even those times when I was present, I did not know that they were carrying on uh, as as they were because I simply couldn't hear them. But the audio recorders uh, pick up some very very interesting stuff. So uh, I'm just a kid in the woods. Um, I'm, I'm kind of the creative type, and I got to scratch both sides of my brain, or let's say tickle both sides of my brain. Uh, and uh, that's in all, all through that journey in the past eight years, I've uh, established the Michigan Aboriginal Project, which is essentially a uh, distillation of uh, this interesting hobby that I have in going to the woods and actually uh, learning as much as I can about the, these ancient people and their ways. And uh, I, I find that there's some interesting parallels between what I've learned and observed in the woods and actually recorded in the woods, what, what mostly on audio, but some on video. Um, I, I'm, I'm convinced that uh, there are some biblical parallels and, and that these beings or some of these beings may very well be referred to directly uh, in, in the uh, narratives of the Old Testament. So I'm, I'm James Lady. I'm just a simple kind of uh, loner, <laughs> self-made loner, uh, and uh, I, I'm I'm curious. I'm, I'm intensely curious, and and uh, that's what that's what led to the Michigan Abor Aboriginal Project. Um, and for the audience, that's where you'll find me on YouTube. Uh, that's I, I am the sole content provider, uh, save for the uh, Santa Claus beliefs and uh, Bigfoot song uh, done by Alan Kane. <laughs> So that was a long-winded introduction. I appreciate that. I hope I didn't lose you. And Miguel, I tell you, I'm a little ADD, and I'll tell your audience that now. Uh, so if you need to, if you feel you need to bring me back full circle, I could, I could use the help. You know? Okay. Well, I appreciate you for sharing all that. And if you would start off with one of your encounters or experiences, what were you doing that day? What happened? And kind of put me in your shoes. Well, uh, you know, I, I've always been an outdoorsman. I used to hunt, and uh, I was an avid camper. So the first three experiences, witness experiences, uh, one was audible, the other uh, were visual, uh, happened before I even, long before I got into this subject. So, you know, just things that, that happened in the woods, some anomalous experiences. Uh, I used to hunt in Alpena, and uh, I was in a blind once, and uh, actually four experiences up there. Uh, but halfway down the shooting alley o over this log was a head um, looking right back at me. And it's it's it, it was near dusk. So late afternoon, it must, I don't know, November, so probably four, five, five o'clock. I don't know when it was exactly, but uh, there were these reflecting eyes uh, and a head just peeking over this log that was, you know, halfway, I don't know, probably, probably 40 yards down the uh, the shooting lane and i didn't know what it was you know I, and um uh i just stared it down and and that left left me thinking for a good long time i was at later asked why i didn't shoot it um and i'm not uh, of the uh, build that will shoot anything that i really don't know what it is so i uh, that was just one of those experiences that you know you know i put it away in the, in the back of my my memory banks and that was just a very interesting so um, interesting thing. Eventually, it just disappeared. It, you know, I must have 
turn my head or something, but it was just gone in an instant. Um, at that same camp, um, I was riding on a, um, I don't know when this was, I think it was not during the hunting season. We were there to um, uh, probably feed or feed, you know, leave some bait, bait piles here and there. Not my favorite uh, approach to hunting, by the way. Um, but uh, I was on the back of a, a three-wheeler. It was that long ago. And I'd, I'd look up and we were going down this little service road that goes from the driveway of the camp into the um, into their 80 acres. Um, and I look up and I see a silhouette uh, down. And it's behind us, probably 50 yards at this point. But I see a silhouette of a human being just disappear into the woods it was like the last moments the last few feet you know uh, that it was present to, to by my vision and it just disappeared in the woods and i it was all it was it was tall and was slender not your typical you know like the uh the iconic bigfoot profile um uh, it was a slender thing and it had a like a mate an army it was deeper than a, uh, an army green it was but it had a green sort of hue into it I don't know why. I've heard a few other reports uh, of people that uh, have have seen that color uh, presented on these on these beans, but um, I thought it was someone from the DM. You know, it just couldn't have been. It's just again one of those little moments in time that um, I I put away, and uh, you know, but you know, you say, oh well, <laughs> whatever that was, it was interesting, and you just go on about your business, and sooner or later forget about it. It's nothing to really dwell on. Um, and then another time out in Idaho, we were uh, uh, camping on a on a Eater River. I don't know if it was to the. It ended up in the Salmon River around uh, Stanley, Idaho. Um, but early in the morning, it was still dark out. I heard someone run through the camp. Someone clearly ran by Beetle through the camp, and I thought it was Mark, uh, our, the other couple's uh, uh, the guy. And uh, I thought he was up early for a jog. I mentioned it later. <laughs> he, he said nobody, nobody was up for a jog, but something clearly ran right through our camp and in the, in the, in the, right along the river. And uh, I'm, I'm convinced that was also one of those things. So uh, it was 2016 uh, when, when the world, I thought, had gone mad. Uh, and I'm a recovering political junkie, uh, but I had to give it all up because it was dry, it, it drives you crazy. Life's too damn short for that. So I thought the world had gone mad in 2016. I was coincidentally um, planning a uh, uh, camping, fishing, canoeing trip up to the Boundary Waters with a few other guys. And this was the first time I really had used YouTube as a research utility. And, uh, and for two and a half, three days, I, I did, I found everything I was looking for. Um, Lakes we were going to go and all the adventures, you know, you could muster in your mind to, to execute while you're there for the week. but. Uh, um there was always this uh bigfoot video on the and the suggested video feed uh that was popping up and it was it was there almost every day and i eventually clicked on that and that's when i had the epiphany that okay this this is amazing uh and and i started you know going down that rabbit hole um and that that was a dangerous thing uh, on so many levels <laughs> dangerous because it was so much it was so fun and so, so amazing, um, uh, the pursuit and the realization that these beings are real, they're out there, and you can actually go and, and hope to see one and, and uh, learn about the, the things they leave behind that uh, tips me off as to where they actually commune at night. And in uh, 2019, late 2018, early 2019, I endeavored a, my first recording project uh, along the, the Huron River uh, in Ann Arbor. And from there, I, I've gotten things that uh, are really quite amazing, um, varying from uh, female speech uh, as recent as 2022. Um, I'm writing this down so I can send you the file. Uh, so I picked up two females um, on, on a recorder in August of 2022. And uh, what it I left a recorder. The audience should know. I, I think structures are a significant part of their culture, and I do believe they have a culture. Uh, and the structures that I've come across 
are published on michiganaboriginal.com or you can you know see some of my older my earlier uh publications um uh and when i was mainly and solely interested in the structures the structure phenomenon was was kind of crazy i mentioned nathan rio earlier i learned about that from his work and his publications so i uh, started recording and was amazed uh, by what i found and and the recording project uh i've recorded in suburban detroit i've recorded in ann arbor that's where the uh, female voices um uh, were recorded one one says uh, Haniawa, I wish you want to and another one nine minutes apart, and I, I keep forgetting whether it's before or after that capture. But another uh, sounds like a different female species. She says, "Eddie ha paskins goes to the east and to the osfa," and it's, that expression is immediately followed by the melodic clicking and clucking that many many eyewitnesses, uh, uh, those that have encounters with these beings, they report having heard this clicking and clucking. Uh, they can. They have a watery sound. Um, I believe, I, I speculate that that is more uh, associated with the juveniles. Uh, but they, you know, like I said, I've picked up conventional speech and this melodic clicking and clucking. So I'll send that file uh, for you. And it's it's just pretty darn amazing. You know, I, I've, I've got about, I think I've, I've tallied it to nine at one point. There's at least nine that I've seen. Uh, one of the most significant encounters I've ever had well, two of them, uh, and I recorded both of them. One is most recent. It was captured uh, October 24th. It was a Monday morning. It was raining. I was awakened by a uh, four-foot juvenile. And I only know that because, you know, I heard this god-awful sound, uh, scared the crap out of me. And I rolled off my, my sleeping pad and look up, and I'm looking up at this little guy uh, or girl. I don't know. Uh, but just a little little one. But he had... It had the most demonic sounding uh, vocalization that was captured on on my audio. So uh, on the YouTube channel, uh, your audience can go and listen. That was called a very rude awakening, and I I, I published that that night uh, the, the, on the twenty fourth because it had awakened me in such a, a start. I was very unnerved, uh, like shaking inside. Um, and and decided to get out of there I, I really was not feeling welcome uh but uh that's audio i i too can send you um the juvenile awakening me uh that was terrifying so around camp i i've had a number of encounters there was a very benign one uh the may of 22 the spring spring trip um there was a good nine footer outside my tent probably about 25 30 feet away uh away and um, it was it was super cool because it was backlit by a near full moon. I don't know if the moon was full or not, but it was backlit and illuminated around. And, and it was kind of a classic, you know, Sabe silhouette. And, and it was really quite beautiful and not terrifying at all. I, I didn't sense any, any need. Um, uh, I think the audio recording I was there going. I did not get on that that one on video. I wish I had because it was just so picturesque, and it's it was it would be very easy to get an after shot the next night because the lighting conditions were exactly the same, and the subjects just not there. Um, the, the first night, I actually convinced myself that it was just some sort of an arborvitae, you know, some evergreen that I I had forgotten was there, and uh, but it was gone in the morning, and that was an amazing thing, truly amazing, it was beautiful. Did you lay eyes on them when you said you oh, heard the yeah. juvenile and recorded them? Oh yeah, with the juvenile. Yeah, I looked up and I saw them, and you could see. You know, this is at six a.m. Mm -hmm. There's still somewhat of a canopy of leaves, on, you know, overhead. Uh, it is late October. Um, it was raining. Uh, I look up and I see this faint figures. You know, no more than four foot tall, probably a little less. Um, and it had moved back after I heard it. It, what I heard at the time, and I'm going from the, the deepest sleep I had had in three nights, I heard this like a hissing, uh, a gravelly, gurgly hissing, uh, which was just god awful. And immediately I'm thinking maybe cougar. Um, we have cougar in Michigan, even though the DNR won't admit it. Um, and uh, I thought maybe that at first, just based on the god awful sound I was, I was enduring. 
but I looked up and it had moved back. So, uh, Miguel, I no longer sleep out in the woods with my rain rain fly on. Uh, I'll put a tarp over my tent, you know, with some tarp poles, and you know, I got and, and plenty of room and uh, stay plenty dry most of the time. Um, and uh, so I rolled over and I am I'm looking through the mesh, the nylon netting, the, the bug net at this figure. So um, um, it, it had moved back it, it, and it was in a like a sailor's, uh, soldier's position, standing straight up, arms to the side, feet together. Just, I mean, it could easily have been, you know, if, if there were a tree nearby, he could have easily been behind it. Uh, and I'd never see it, but um, I saw just a rough silhouette um you know where, where the arms are separated from the torso you know it was darker and i couldn't make out any details of the face i didn't see any eye shine either uh which was interesting um and it, but uh i i assessed the situation as quickly as possible and still much of my disbelief it's hard to believe that these things happen when they're actually happening and you recall them afterward it's 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 you're always kind of thinking this is just too crazy but then is it real um but but and thank goodness the audio recorder was going at the time because <laughs> it's as real as it gets you can hear that thing and it sounds demonic uh it had a really powerful voice of course i'm coming from a, a dead sleep but um maybe maybe that obscures things for me a little bit but that that happens and i recorded it i saw the subject and uh i barked out i said hey and he flinched at that moment and then I, I reach out my arm and I say, get out of here. And he was gone before my arm was fully extended. He was he was gone. And I heard maybe one step of it leaving. Um, they're so stealthy. still. So. OK, what about the other individual that you saw, the bigger one? Did you see and that one there? I, yeah, it, it was backlit by the moon. And, and um, I'm thinking, oh, my God. And I then I'm thinking, oh, that's just a tree that I you know didn't remember was there. I got up and did my business. I had to go, you know, potty. And I, I do that in the tent nowadays. I don't go out uh, because you never know what's going to happen out there. Uh, but when I got back in bed, it was still there. And I'm further convinced that it was like an arm body that I forgot because it had every opportunity to leave, um, you know, when I was, you know, going to take a leak. So, um, yeah, that, that, that was super, super cool. And not a menacing event at all my, my first encounter at that campsite was uh october 30th in 2016 this is the second trip i had one trip in uh september and and i had this this next trip in october uh like you know, a month later uh, i don't know five weeks maybe uh but it was my last night there it was october 30th and uh i went to i had I had no luck all day. Uh, it was my fourth night. I had a friend join me two of the four nights, um, and he he wanted to see what this whole Bigfoot you know structure and you know all this Bigfoot hunting was all about. So uh, he he came up and I shared him with, uh, with him a few things, a few of my findings, some TPs that I found, and he remains skeptical. Uh, and I wish he were there for that last night, but he wasn't. It was about uh, ten thirty. Uh, was it that late? 9 30 40 10 uh, it's not clear on me right now but uh i, I was going to brush my teeth and go to bed so i'm brushing my teeth i go to the side of the camp and i've got my uh red headlamp on i don't like bright lights in the woods so i use the, the red lights uh, uh so i don't i don't get blinded and uh i go to the side of the camp to spit my toothpaste out and i look up and and um i'm looking at two eyes and they were massive they're really really big and they're really wide, wide set. So uh, I, it took me a, a, just moments to figure out that it was likely one of these beings, because I don't know of any other beast in the woods that had eyes that big and that far apart. Um, so it was a big, long stare down for the longest time. Um, and I, I knew that if I broke the impasse, I'm, I'm not going to see it again. I would likely never, ever see it again. So um it, it was just a big stare down eventually it closed its right eye so the one off to the left by my perspective it just closed it you know it's not like it and, you know it turned its head and said hide one eye just closed it and um uh, and my thinking is that perhaps it was getting a little oversensitized to my red red headlamp 
it was probably um, 30 yards away, max. Um, max, I can't imagine it being any, any farther than that. Um, eventually, uh, I, I was thinking, okay, we could do this all night. So I, I did break the impasse. I, I, as nonchalantly as possible, turned around, and that was a, that was a scary thing to do. Um, and I, I just casually walked by back to my camp, back into camp. I grabbed my uh, flashlight and camera, um, and then I turned them on, and I ended up capturing a subject um, in the background uh, between two trees. And it, it's uh, it's about a six tenths of a second capture, but it shows a subject in the background pivoting from the right to the left. Um, it appears to be white or light gray. Um, and if you ask me, and I'll go ahead and say it, some people might doubt it, but that I, I, the, the video is, is not the highest quality, but I believe it reveals another subject with it. Um, and it's as if uh, they were moving in tandem and I may be wrong. I don't know. I'd love to get some expert, you know, analysis of that that video. Someone, someone well beyond the qualifications of someone like Bigfoot Tony, who uh, he and I have uh, crossed paths before. But uh, <laughs> he he uh, uh, has an interesting take uh, on mine. But this has been verified. There's enough movement in the subject. You can tell it's moving. You can see the ocular recess and the auricular recess. You can make out the shape of the the body, large trapezius muscles. The left arm uh, casts a shadow on its buttocks as it pivots from, from the right to the left, and, and that leaves a dark impression on, on the, the buttocks of, of this subject. So uh, um, I, I didn't see it that night when I had the, the camera rolling. I didn't think I had captured anything because I didn't see anything. Uh, and so February of the next year, I pulled that footage and uh, started to scrub through it. And I spent hours on that. Um, I have some pretty interesting things, but they're also very obscure things. But the one, the one uh, apparition, if you will, that I will hang my hat on is that one caught in the background, um, and it pivots from right to left. And you can see that on on my the homepage of uh, MichiganAboriginal.com. You can see the. And there are a couple of takes on it, uh, different perspectives, and but you can see that yeah, it's clearly an upright bipedal, you know, hominid figure back there, back in the woods. Um, whether or not there's one with it uh, is debatable. Uh, I believe there is, and it's at, you know, you've heard of the, the phenomenon of counting coup. Uh, I think that's what these things do on a regular basis. Given the frequency of visitation to that camp, uh, I think uh, we are there for their entertainment, <laughs> and they are there to uh, you know mess with us if they will. If they wish, uh, but for the most part, to to learn, uh, learn. I guess that's only speculation, but you know they're there and they're watching. Yeah, it does seem like they're observing us to possibly teach the juveniles or just to learn human activity in general. Yeah, I think so. And you know, they might know our our nature better than we do. I mean, we lie to ourselves all the time about how good we are. <laughs> but as a people, humanity stinks. I mean, think about it. Look at the, the upside down world we're living in, right? So, um, I, 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 I think they they must know me. I mean, if I wasn't aware or savvy to their you know existence in that valley until 2016, when I convinced myself that these things were real, and, and I've been uh, in their backyard all the time. So. Uh, my focus changed, and uh, I'm grateful for it because it's uh, the, the world's greatest adventure on a beer budget. Yeah, it's hard to tell what they really know. I've heard a researcher say that they're like autistic, or they can possibly memorize everything in the woods and know if something is off. Yeah, I think they do. They really do. Um, you can go back. There's some interesting uh, structures that I found just outside of my camp. There's a I think there's a video called uh, Bent with Fascination. Fascination is not spelled like fascination. Fasten is F-A-S-T-E-N. Because they fashioned um, um, three things together. It was a, a, a limber tree that was easily bendable onto bark. And that bark was affixed to a stick, which it, it was kind of pushed into the ground. So it 
form this loop. And it's amazing. Anybody, I mean, can walk by it and never notice it. It wasn't until I, I, I learned that they manipulate wood and things in the woods. Um, you know, tree bends is one thing. I think a lot of tree bends are natural. Uh, a lot of what you'll find on the internet on the interweb with all of us out there looking and you know trying to trying to find these being uh, a lot of the stuff that is portrayed as Sasquatch activity, I think are can more easily be attributed to weather anomalies, that kind of thing. So what I look for are things that are clearly constructed, like teepees, wigwams, uh, lean tunes. Um, and uh, when we find a little you know bent tree affixed by bark. And, and and anchored with a stick, that is a little beyond, I mean, truth is stranger than fiction, I get it, but that truly, to me, seems ma manipulated. Um, yeah, absolutely. It looks like you've found a lot of TP yeah, structures and um, forts. Can you dive into that a little bit? Yeah, and, and again, I, I, I was first savvy to this notion that these beings create you know, these structures. And I start finding them in interesting places that have a lot of uh, uh, commonality, like um, the intersections of rivers, bridges, uh, power lines, railways, even highways. Uh, around these intersections, often I'll, I'll explore. Um, and when I find these structures, it indicates to me that it's a likely habitat for, or at least nocturnal dwelling space for these beings. Um, one of the earliest captures I got was January 6th, uh, 2019. I left a recorder there, and this, I, I, and I published some of the stuff I've gotten from there, but I haven't published all of it because I thought it's so unique uh, that it might make for you know good documentary fodder. Um, but I, you know, time is short, and it never happened, so it, I should just probably just, just get it out there. Uh, but it, the uh, the recording starts with a subject snoring, and I presume. What, what made me record the particular TP was I noticed some activity around it with a teacup and some other stuff that uh, uh, I indicated to me that, uh, you know, I, a juvenile play. It indicated to me that there was a juvenile in the air. It was like childish play. And, and it was that play was sort of mimicking a play setting, you know, with that teacup. That teacup would change uh, over the week or a couple of weeks that I had been exploring this area. It would move, you know, here, from here to there. Uh, so I eventually left a recorder there and it starts out with snoring. You can hear uh, a female subject in the background or some close by. She coughs. I actually have uh, three incidences of her coughing. Two of them are within 19 seconds of that. Uh, I can actually send you that. Um, that, I mean, and it sounds human. When she coughs, it sounds 100% human. But the interesting thing is, as that night goes on, the recorder picked up some other things that sound like cymbals going off or some sort of a, one. There's one sound that sounds like a, a toilet flushing. Really, really weird stuff. So you have, you know, human type sounds recorded, snoring, you know, coughing, and other weird stuff on the same footage that, that sounds, you know, like demons um and other other recordings oh my gosh i got so much i could share with you i, I think i've forgotten more than i i now know and talk about as, as being new and interesting sasquatch vocalizations but um it, it's a it's an interesting field and do i know for sure that you know they're sasquatch i don't know i i wasn't there uh but they do speak and they seem to have a culture um they seem to think in the abstract having the ability to conceive and, and, and build stick structures um you know it remains a, a, a hell of a mystery yeah one of the structures on your website that i found really interesting is the circular structure with the sapling it looks like it's tied into a circle Oh, oh, the uh, the knot in the branch. Yeah, the knot in the branch. Like, isn't that something? Yeah, yeah, I've got a few different pictures of that one in the winter and the. Uh, yeah, that that is beyond my reach on uh, a pathway, a man-made pathway up onto this the top of the hill, which is like a bifurcation. There's a feeder stream to a river, and then the river itself, and and this this uh, land, this hill, this point, 
the bifurcation in the landscape was formed, you know, by the Rivian streams. Um, and it's on the way up there. So it's, I, you know, I cannot reach, you know, I'm 5'10 ish. Uh, used to be 5'10 and a half. <laughs> I'm getting older now, so I'm shrinking. Um, and I, you know, I could reach up and I could not, I could not reach that. Um, so either someone on a horse did it, which I don't think that happened, um, only because there are other artifacts there, like a TP uh, and other stuff. And I've picked up vocalizations there as well. Okay, thank you for sharing. And as I'm looking on the Michigan Aboriginal Project website, I saw one, it's a, a few TP structures, but on one of the trees, it looks like there's a blue painted marker. What do you think that means? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, one of these places where um, I re recorded, they're actually Den One or House One. I think other people are on to these uh, beams and doing their own study. The University of Michigan is just a hop, skip, and a jump from one of these wallows in Ann Arbor that I, I'm speaking of, where I've gotten some amazing uh, stuff. So you're going to see some overlap between, you know, their, our footprint and theirs on, on this earth. Um, you know, the, I, I, I believe that our, our rivers, our streams, even some of our drainage systems like uh, storm drainage under, under cities like Mount Clemens, Michigan, just north of here, I believe uh, they are utilized uh, by these beams as their main highways. So um, water is the essential element when I'm, I'm looking at, on Google Earth uh, for likely habitat. And likely places to look and you know for these little uh what making the rio used to call wallows um so did i answer your question yeah and i just wanted to yeah, mention that one of the eight my add moments oh you're fine one of the structure areas that i've found in the past there were these orange markers around the pine trees surrounding the structures and i thought oh man they're gonna log all of this they never logged anything, and it seems like somebody marked that area. And I was watching yeah. NVTV the other day, and there's a video called This One is the Most Creepiest Footage Captured on Camera. That's the title of the video. But um, okay. I think it's a guy in California, and he finds all these structures. I noticed those same orange rings on the trees where he was walking around the structure area. No kidding. Mm -hmm. And none of it's logged well, either. Yeah, I've seen I've seen red, orange, and blue uh, paint out there, um, and I don't know if I included in the artifacts gallery a little mini TP. Do you see anything with a mini TP? Because there's a little bit of red, but that red in that valley isn't. Uh, it's it's a few miles away where I, I noticed that the loggers, uh, logging companies were doing their thing and they were using the same paint. So mm -hmm. I think that that stick that was used in the mini TP, which is within a bigger TP. Um, was carried uh, or found, you know, miles away and brought back to this, you know, communal space. Yeah, and come to think of it, I actually interviewed a lady. Her name is Tammy from Michigan, and she sent me photos of structures, and they had those orange rings around the tree. And I asked her about that, and she was like, "Huh, I never thought about that." Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't. I I think it's I, my my simple thinking is it's it's likely that uh, there's regular, you know. Uh, forestry, you know, maneuvers going on in the woods, and they're just using some of these uh, uh, artifacts or wooden sticks. And it makes me, I, it makes me wonder. You know, I know st stick structures are significant in the culture. I don't know why, um, but it seems they have somewhat of a, a spiritual um, connection with, you know, I, you know, we call him God. I, I believe God is real, and we all, you know, all trees go to the heavens and. And I think perhaps that uh, the structures may be some sort of uh, spiritual worship. And interestingly enough, uh, Miguel, uh, I've recorded these beings uh, chanting, and it sounds beautiful. I mean, it's it sounds, they sound like Benedictine monks um, chanting, and it's, it's, it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Yeah, you'll have to send me that so, too. Yeah, trees are interesting because they connect from solid ground into open space. And um, yeah. those are two different worlds. They say, as above, so below. Yeah, yeah. And, and the, you know, as it is in heaven, as it, so will it be on earth. You know, so that's, uh, it's, it, there's a bit biblical right there, <laughs> you know. Um, and I, I don't know what these things are, but I believe they're 
to be many different kinds. Uh, the chanting blew my mind. Um, you know, it's uh, if anybody's interested in this um, in this subject from a biblical perspective, pick up the works of Dr. Michael Heiser. He has a book called Unseen Realm, and um, and from Psalm 82, he was exposed to while doing his doctorate. He, he read it for the first time in Hebrew, and it changed his entire um, perspective uh, regarding the Bible and its supernatural origins. So he contends that the unseen world are uh, is a world occupied by by spiritual beings, disembodied, you know, Nephilim or whatever. Uh, there are all different types of spirits. There are both angels and demons, and uh, you know. In this very valley, the same same campsite, uh, another it, it, it's this this one is troubling. It's hard to listen to, although I've listened to it a thousand times. I'll never forget the ultimate dread I experienced when I realized uh, I was I was having an encounter with something so much greater than I am. It, okay, so in sheer size, number one, I, I hear someone yelling, uh, "This all chi chi chu ha!" This is uh, October twenty first, two thousand nineteen. Same campsite. I hear the vocalization, some other madness. Um, and again, the recorder is going. So it picks up not only what I hear, but it picks up so much more, both before and after the moment that I uh, knew I was having the encounter. And so this is this is the first time I realized that they have they do, in fact, have an ability to speak within the sound or the general din of the woods. Like that, that night it was raining. And um it's interesting that a lot of these vocal encounters happen when it's raining. Um, the juvenile uh, that we spoke of earlier, and these these other beings. I never saw any of the one any of the beings on October twenty first, two thousand nineteen. I sure did hear them, and uh, I felt like it, uh, half an inch tall when I when I realized what was really going down. And uh, recorder picked up a lot of things that do sound, in fact, demonic. They do sound sometimes angelic. Uh, they some there are voices that sound gremlinish. They're little like pixie-like voices. At the very end of that clip, the ten minutes that I published, there's a, a, a like a pixie-like expression that says "Ober Kebab" in a much higher voice than I just said it, and uh, it, it, it's there. And 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 like seconds before that, there's a a, a female angelic-sounding voice. That actually sounds like we do love him in this angelic voice, and it's it's like what? It's weird. I'm telling you, Miguel, it's weird. So, be they angelic or demonic or or simply uh, uh, otherwise mortal. Um, you know, I mentioned Psalm 82. It speaks of God's divine counsel, uh, and and men were made in their image. You know, God says my image. Uh, at one point, I think it's in Genesis, he says, made in our image. Um, and maybe, I'm not a biblical scholar, so if there are those in the audience that are, forgive me if I get anything wrong, but that's my current uh, knowledge and, and thinking on this, you know, this existence. Uh, the unseen realm, you know, I have a recording and I never saw anything, so it remains unseen. This realm uh, of various voices within the woods, coming from the woods, that I can't always here. Well, for the most part, you can't. Sometimes you, you can sense it. it, it there's like a, harm, I call it a harmonic resonance that you can sense. And this is when, you know, when the hairs stand up on the, the back of your, your, in the back of your neck, um, I think this may be the result of your body or your hair, which is, or, or, you know, it gives it, it's an extra sensory, right? It, and there, the hair is picking up this uh, harmonic resonance, perhaps, in the woods. It's just, a plausible scenario um yeah that's an excellent that, that's theory it, yeah well it's, i've got the audio stuff to actually back it up so i don't know what mm. else to think okay. uh, regarding their abilities because i was there and, and i didn't hear most of it i heard some of it uh i'll send you a minute 20 uh clip mm. we'll have to, if you don't mind i'd love to uh connect on facebook you can seek me out because um, it, it's easier to transfer files uh, through Messenger. Uh, mailing some of these files, uh, they're, they're big, but I'll okay. do what I can. Yeah, Sasquatch yeah. Theories on Facebook, too. 
So just look it up and oh, you, right on. you okay. can share Beautiful. files there. I, I was going to ask you, I found excellent. it really interesting about the vocalizations. Why do you think you have caught vocalizations during the rain? Is that typical? Uh, well, I, I've captured other vocalizations, like, you know, that video that I got, uh, I've, I've published this, uh, I've published, uh, enough. There's a six second clip, which is the main little clip that shows the subject and it pans away and then back to the same space and the subject's gone. Right. Uh, that's, and that, that all happens in six seconds. Um, there is a, a vocal on there at the four second mark of that little clip. Which can be found on on the uh, the homepage, um, even on I think it's my lead video on the uh, on the YouTube channel. But there's like a cooing. It's a it's a, it's a cooing. It's difficult for me to mimic, uh, and it's very subtle. Um, but they do have that ability to coo. And I've heard other people's eyewitness. I did not hear it that night. Like I said, I didn't even think that I captured anything on on, on video that night. But I've heard other people say that they have um, experienced and heard that cooing. And we all know they they can mimic just about anything they they like, um, even gunshot. I have an interesting recording I can send that one to you too. Yeah, I'd like to hear um, that one day. And most yeah, of well, I thought. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I, I thought there were actually were gunshots when I initially recorded because it's the very beginning. I mean right at the very beginning of a 13 hour audio capture. Uh, mm -hmm. That was a mistake. I usually put it on the recorders on VCVA mode just to minimize my work. It's, it's a ton of work, um, to, you know, going through this audio. But, um, but yeah, the gunshots is pretty amazing. And I went to, I, I, I do little clips every once in a while with the hopes of some someday doing a documentary. But um, I was cleaning up the gunshot audio and I'm thinking, holy cow. It, it seems that there are juvenile subjects close to the recorder and they're also vocalizing somewhat in sync with this louder gunshot, you know, uh, rapid fire going off in the background. It's really, I mean, when you listen to it, very, it's difficult to hear. And a lot of this is very esoteric. Uh, I get that. And for you naysayers out there, just take a look at the totality of my evidence and the, and the results that I've gotten by pretty much adhering to the same method, which is close to the scientific method uh, in, in, in my uh, method of, you know, locating places and, and getting these vocalizations. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. And here in the Midwest, in Missouri, most of the vocalizations I've heard in the past are like whoops, grunts, um, growls, mm -hmm. things yeah. like that. I've never heard them, like, actually communicate with, like, a distinct language but i've noticed like up north further up north they they have more of a distinct language that sounds almost native american even their structures are a little bit more intricate just kind of kind of like that sapling circular structure that i seen on your website yeah. and the structures yeah. that are kind of tied in together with sticks seems a little bit more intricate maybe um here they're losing touch with their um native selves or what they really used to be maybe they're breaking down and becoming more animalistic per se could be i don't know um i i do believe there are different kinds and they, i have to believe there are different uh very you know variations of them even regionally um you know i have some things in southern michigan that i've recorded that i've never recorded up north those that are the subjects to that are in the valley that, where I record, they seem to, to be a little, a little more sophisticated. I mean, good Lord, they're chanting, right? <laughs> they seem to have some sort of culture. Mm -hmm. I believe, you know, it's just my opinion. Could be wrong, but I don't, I don't think I am based on everything I've observed. They're, they're an ancient people, and it seems they have some really unbelievable otherworldly abilities. Um, uh, at, at least in the, the uh, field of their vocalizations. Um, you know, I don't know if they can disappear or not. I have not had that experience. Uh, I don't doubt Davy Crockett, who wrote of his experience, and basically, it, it, you know, said it appeared, you know, right in front of me and then disappeared as if the frog off a, or the mist off a frog pond in the morning. I think those were his words. Yeah. Wow. And you've been around a lot of Bigfoot activity. You found a lot of things. Have you ever seen any orbs in the woods or found a connection between 
the lights and Sasquatch? Yeah, I wish I could say yes, but I have not had that experience. I'm dying to see an orb that sounds like one of the coolest things I, I you know, that you could ever witness. Uh, I think you've seen one, didn't I say? Didn't you? I hear. I hope I'm not confusing it with somebody else. Um, but yeah. the, the orb phenomenon, I have not experienced it. Uh, but I really would like to, mm-hmm. and and how they relate to the woods or the universe or the Sasquatch, uh, I have no idea. But I have no doubt in my mind that they do, in fact, exist. Um, but and I'd love to see one. I would absolutely love to see one. And you know, you know, Yuri Geller, um, Yuri Geller, as a as a kid, as a youth, um, said he saw this this you know ball of light and energy, and he he made contact with it. And I believe he attributes his his supernatural supernatural abilities. Um, that got the interest of the CIA when they did work together. Um, it, it, it's it, I'm not encouraging anybody to go chasing orbs or even to feed the orbs. <laughs> so don't feed the orbs because we don't know what they are. It sounds, sounds a little too dangerous, but um, we just don't know. I've not had that experience. I'd like to. And I've never seen a UFO, although I do believe that they do in fact exist. Well, I appreciate you for sharing that. I wanted to ask you, what type of audio recorders are you using out in the field? Uh, I got a cheap, uh, hold on, I got one over here in my, my bag. I do have a Zoom that I keep around the camp because it's a, a, a battery drainer. It requires a lot of battery. Yeah, I don't think I can get more than eight, eight, uh, eight hours on that one. But I got the the ones I actively use now. It's a it's called an Olympus DM720. Um, has the ability to just uh, record in um, like large format. What's the, the dot wave? I think also has the ability to uh, record in MP3. Um, recently spoke to a professor of audiology or something like that up in Montana. He's like, you know, got got to go with the wave files. Um, so the Olympus DM720 has the ability to do both. I only have two of those, and I have a, a, a lesser Olympus. I think it's the DM7200 or, or DVM 7200, something like that. It's a cheap one. It has no computer interface, which is a problem when you want to retrieve the files. Yeah. Uh, but any any recorder that is effective in, in, in capturing these. You know, these are just handhelds that I can obscure with leaves. Uh, they find them most of the time, the recorders. Um, just, you know, but they never taken them. They never moved them from the spot. I've had them shoved deeper in, um, a few times. Um, but, uh, they've never taken them. Yeah. I have the same audio recorders and they work pretty good. They have the timer on them to where they'll turn on. Yeah. On their that's own why I got off. it. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. That helps so, out a lot. It, which is great. Yeah. I used to use lithium batteries on them, but, uh, those have shot up in price, right? So I'm back to the old Durso. Uh, and I can't justify spending 50 bucks for that. That's, it's a, it's a lot. I, I get very little revenue from, from this activity. It's my hobby, right? So it's, it's all self-funded mm-hmm. and, uh, I, I'd love, love for anybody to buy a t-shirt to help, help ease the uh, financial burden. I'm between jobs right now, which is okay. It gives me a chance to focus on this kind of stuff. And, and yeah. uh, I know that I'll uh, the be only th- employed again soon. Yeah, yeah, hopefully. The only thing that I, I have to um, say about the Olympic, the Olympus uh, 720 DMs is uh-huh. you can't plug up an external battery to them. And I think that's a downfall. Oh, yeah. If, that, if I had that ability, I didn't even know you could do that. Um, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, I try to be a minimalist or a minimalist, um, uh, even in data, which I've changed my habits. I, I do need to record more in that wave and, and, and go in higher resolution because that, that, uh, the one I captured, um, on October 30th, 2019, um, is in the background. It's only shot at 30 frames a second, which I thought at the time would be enough. And it, it is enough to reveal. Um, you know, the body contour and, uh, you know, to, to reveal its shape through movement. Um, but uh, I have to encourage everybody going out um, uh, out there to do this kind of thing. Um, yeah, record in that way if you can. Um, spend, a, spend a few extra cents in storage <laughs> costs, you know. 
It sounds but, a lot you know, better. There huh? is data, you know. Yeah, well, it's supposed to be, and uh, you know, you want to. I don't know. I have I, the the fact that even on the crappiest recorder I have, I've gotten some really amazing stuff. I don't think the fact that it's a crappy recording recorder recording an MP3. I don't think that's you know such a bad thing. And I'm a novice. I I only learn enough to get done what I need to get done. Uh, and I, there's learning curve to everything. But what I've learned, hey, I'm just grateful to have the recording, right? Captures uh, captures some of these uh, vocal modalities that uh, uh, helped me decipher, you know, one of my encounters that that which is published in that 10 minutes uh, audio that, with that crazy stuff. It's weird. It's really really wild. But you know, the, the, to the casual listener, you really have to suspend any disbelief. Uh, in a lot because there, there are the stuff is real um, you know there are some purists out there said you know thinker thunker commented on one of my videos today that I posted, posted up on his fan page months ago I think <laughs> he, just today he, he responded uh, saying it's too bad that you know, that it's not the raw audio well I directed them to you know raw audio what I do see I'm an artistic photographer and I sell I sell art um, Unless I do something with that raw footage or that raw capture in film or digital capture, unless I enhance it, you have to enhance the colors, make it beautiful, change the, the cropping a little bit. You, you really want to optimize the emotional response that you seek to solicit, you know, from, from the viewer of, of the art. So um, there are a lot of criticisms out there for um, moving away from the original capture and the original capture can only tell you that something's there in many cases and until you go through a process of developing that footage meaning minor incremental changes in and applying this and that filter reducing the noise uh increasing the amplitude or the, the volume um all of that needs to happen to really reveal what is what more is there i mean and it clarifies so when I'm publishing a lot of audio, it's not always the raw stuff. It's that which I had to, you know, develop, uh, not change, but incrementally uh, purify, if you will. And it goes through a purification process. And much as, you know, you were to, to purify silver, it, it takes many, many steps of, of melting and, you know, getting back to solid state, melting again. I think I'm not a, not a silversmith, but I think that's what I've learned in my biblical studies. <laughs> if I've learned anything. Yeah. Uh, so those, yeah, that, that stuff that I put out there is actually, you know, if I didn't do that, I wouldn't uh, know what all, what uh, is all is there. I mean, some s speech and other vocal uh, expressions are hidden by uh, the poor quality of a, a simple raw audio footage. So uh, I have no qualms about developing that footage so that the listener can you know have an experience and know what's truly going on uh there's nothing the only thing that's taken away is noise and things that prevent you from hearing other things and it's i i get it i, I could i've over modulated some of my publications that's fine that's a fair criticism but it's just another iteration of the available evidence um and learn from it what you will should it shouldn't be criticized because there's a lot of value in uh in both the raw and the developed footage yeah absolutely so are there any other encounters or experiences that you'd like to talk about any other finds yeah there's uh one one when i had all my gear with me and i didn't use any of it because uh my daughters were protesting <laughs> they're they're not a fan of this subject this this happened in 2019. It was June 2019. Where were you at? I had my crazy experience. Um, oh, maybe it was no wait. It was 20. The 20 up in Marquette, uh, the place in Marquette. Just, let's see. I'm trying to think of the exact date and year. I think it was June. Anyway, I was with my two daughters, um, and and one of my daughter's friends, and who grew up in the UP. We went up to uh, Little Presque Isle Point, which is just northwest of Marquette. Um, and it's a place where you can go out and do a little moon moon gazing, which the girls wanted to do. But this was like after midnight, and I didn't want them to go alone. I was tuckered out from like two hikes that day. 
but you know that area is so beautiful it's, uh, and and I wasn't about to let that go now so I went I had all my gear my recording gear I had my pistol on my side and uh, uh, we went out to the pier to the end and I was playing a little bit with my uh, infrared camera I bought this cheap little thing on Amazon but just having a little bit of fun with that getting into the equipment um, I had uh, I had, I did Brooke, my youngest, she she went off somewhere, and I thought she went down the shoreline opposite uh, where my other daughter and her friend were. So I, I called out, you know, his name Brooke. I it's, uh, when thinking back, it sounded maybe like a, someone doing a Sasquatch call. You, you know, I look out, you know, I'm calling Brooke along the shoreline, <laughs> and really loud, and uh, didn't hear from. Her. Now I'm starting to panic, and I go back, and it turns out she had just gone inland a little bit, and then kind of came back out. And she was with my uh, daughter and Elizabeth, their, their friends. So um, anyway, on the way out, we were not quite to the car. It was probably, I don't know, uh, within 50 yards of the car or something like that. Uh, I'm, I'm looking, I'm behind the girls, maybe by 15, 20 feet. And I'm looking at a red light. Uh, and I thought it was maybe a reflector in the woods. Uh, I had my red head headlamp on again. And uh, I catch this red actually two two lights it turns out to be eye shine it was the first time i had ever seen um red eye shine and based on what i knew back then at the time i'm thinking okay this is bad red eyes are bad red in the woods this is bad i had never seen for all the years i've been out in the woods i've never seen red eye shine and these were big eyes and really wide set and um and uh, I call the girls back. They come back, back, and I'm on my knees. I'm trying to figure it out. I say, girls, you see this? What, what is that? And then uh, these two re reflectors that I was trying to rule out, they start to move. Um, they move very, almost imperceptibly to its left, so toward our right. And that happens to be toward the, the parking lot. And then it moved very slowly back. And that's when I, when it, by the time it got back to its original you know, facing position after the very slow movement. Another eye had appeared to its right, so to our left, just a singular eye. And between those two, and I guess then to be apart by maybe three, three, four feet, maybe. Uh, but between those two and above it, another singular eye made an appearance of this eye, another big eye, and I only saw one. It was revealed by the, the, the silhouette of leaves being moved from it. I saw the silhouette of leaves move away to reveal this eye so i'm thinking oh shit they shoot sorry uh there are three of these things and uh that's when i told my girls i said uh please you know uh don't run it was my first uh, stay together don't run and, and let's go back and fire. they they witnessed all of this except my youngest brooke she did she did not witness that she's a little shorter in stature and she was in the back of the, the huddle yeah. And, uh, yeah, that was, that was terrifying. And Elizabeth, the, the, the young lady who grew up in the UP, uh -huh. she had never had an experience like that. And I had my recording equipment. I had my FLIR. I had, I had, uh, I had my GoPro, I had my, all that. And I just didn't even think at all to, to pull them out at the time. Because once you realize that, okay, this is a living being, those eyes moved and this is eye shine and they're huge and really wide set. It's like, it, it was pretty, it was pretty, my daughters were terrified. Uh, uh, Elizabeth and, and Abigail were anyway. But, yeah, I can only yeah. imagine. How high off the ground were these eyes? Uh, they seem they seem to be lower than us. Now, this is interesting. I had gone back some months later. So this wasn't in June. It was in June. It was in August. I took a family vacation, and my wife, uh, uh, my fiance at the time, joined us as well. And uh, my daughter, we were back in the same spot, and I had her uh, tell me when she thought I was at the place where we saw the eyes from, from the path, from the trail. So I went. It was about 60 feet. And right beyond that 60 feet was a, uh, a downward hill. Like that 60 feet was a little ridge. And if you went much further, you'd be down. So uh, what, originally at the time, it appeared we were at least eye level, or they were maybe a little below us. It's, I attribute that to the fact that they were beyond that ridge um, the night that uh, we made eye contact. And I believe that one that very slowly moved to the left and right, I think was basically saying, go, you know, leave. Um, I've not had the mind speak experience. In other ways, as, as often and as, as close as I have been 
to these things. I, I don't, I cannot identify with anybody that has that claims they have had that, had that, uh, that mind speak uh, business. I don't doubt it. I just haven't had that experience. Anything, I mean, I, anything can happen. If you listen to the vocalization of the, the angelic and demonic voices uh, during that 10 minutes um, audio publication, which was surrounding that, that encounter, um, you know, nothing's too hard to believe. Once you can fully grasp the, the sheer number of individual vocals that were that were uh, the vocal signatures that were captured that night, um, and in the in the the many angelic and demonic ways uh, voices were expressed. Yeah, yeah, I've heard of a lot of reports here in Missouri where people see the red eye shine, and they're very adamant about what they encountered. And a lot of these are down to earth people, hardworking people, and they don't have very many experiences, but they'll swear up and down that they seen red eyes and some of them were self illuminated. Some were seen, you know, like when they hit the brake light, they could see big oh. shining eyes, things like that. Yeah. That's terrifying. Knowing they're behind you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, I haven't seen so that yet, but and... I have seen eyes shine whenever I hit a whole clan of Sasquatch with the, the spotlight and I thought it was deer. They were like glowing like a gold color, maybe like a yellowish green color, but they were low yeah. to the ground too. And this is kind of like a mind speak story. I mean, I didn't hear anything, but I thought to myself whenever I was looking at these eyes, cause the light would only penetrate like the front of the woods. It wouldn't like hit into the woods and light up everything. I was thinking, man, maybe those are deer. If that was Sasquatch, the eyes would be much higher off the ground. And as soon as I thought that, one of the sets of eyes goes up to about like 10 or 12 feet, like an elevator. <laughs> yeah, it was Holy scary. Cow. Yeah. And oh, I actually yeah. seen a Sasquatch right after that. After I seen that group hit him with the spotlight, I heard ch -ch 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 -ch, something coming from the other direction. So I spun around and I was shining the light in that direction and a big gray one walked through a clearing. I was like, oh my God, wow. that's them. And I, I didn't go outside. Didn't I was rush. terrified. I mean, when you, when you, yeah. When you, it's such a rush though. Like actually as, as intimidated as I have and as unnerved as I have been in the past, I, I'm going to go back. You know, I just, mm -hmm. I love being out there. I love sleeping on the ground. I love, I love the valley and just driving through it and chilling and taking in all of nature and doing whatever the hell you want at your own chosen speed. And, um, it's just, uh, it's my favorite playground and it's a, just a wonderful, wonderful place to be. And you'll hear me in some of my videos. I, I liken this place to like Eden. And when you think about it, our watersheds are like in Eden, like, uh, you know, the source of all water is the source of all life. And, uh, and, um, on earth, you know, I, I believe that Eden still exists. Uh, we just call it the woods. Yeah, very well could be. Okay. What other experiences do you have? What else would you like to share? Oh, uh, God, what other experiences? Um, I just, I've experienced the house slab back at the hunting camp. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a big crack on the side of the house. We all went out to investigate. There was nothing on the roof. There was nothing on the side of the house. It was definitely a, it, just this big crack. Um, this happened. Uh, it was dark, probably after nine o'clock. Uh, a bunch of bunch of hunters inside, you know, playing cards and drinking and throwing darts. And, uh, you know, the, it's this counting coup kind of thing that uh, these beings are just far closer to us than we ever really realized. If you're not savvy or clued into their existence, you could easily just, you know, remain ignorant for an entire lifetime. You know, you know open your mind up to this. Uh, other experiences, you know, uh, I just warn people that uh, there is a cost doing this, not only financial in time, but uh, social-wise, you know. Um, I've had relationships that have been strained. You know, my, my relationship now with my daughters is estranged. Um, you know, I, I chose not to involve them too much, but they were they were parts and privy to my early enthusiasm while I was going down the rabbit hole. I think I kind of turned them off to it. And it, it's, it really is unfortunate that the people you want to share this experience with most, your friends, your family, your children, your, pa you know, your parents, they don't want to hear it. It's like I'm, it's it's the most frustrating and 
I might even say insulting thing <laughs> that someone can experience because hey, you've seen them, I've seen them. It's easy for you and I to speak of this reality, but you know, people don't want to hear about it. I think people's heads are so far up their rear ends um, these days or in their phones. Um, and maybe they're the same thing. You know, people don't realize that this uh, is a real phenomenon. So uh, I, I've gone down the rabbit hole. Uh, I don't wish for anybody else to uh, suffer relationship wise. Uh, that so consider this a gift to your listening audience. Uh, I, 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 uh, this this phenomenon is real, and there's so much to learn from it. Um, just the, I mean, I, I'll sit at a bar sometimes and just strike up a conversation just to test the waters to see change, <laughs> test their sense of humor. And occasionally, you get someone who's you know really interested and intrigued about this subject. And I'm happy to talk to them about it because I can't talk about it at home. I got to do it at some, you know, some stranger at a happy hour. <laughs> right. And how has this affected you know, your relationships? Diving down well, into I the rabbit hole. My, you know, my wife now, she, she, when we were engaged, she was going to let me go. She told me, she's like, like, I'm thinking about letting you go. Um, my response to that was that that would be unfortunate. Uh, we are ha very happily married now. She's an amazing woman. She's, finally not rolling her eyes anymore about you know when i speak of this um our hosts um for easter supper yesterday our host father uh, is interested in the subject he wants me to speak at one of his men's groups um which i'm happy to do uh, but he you know he was asking so i'm not gonna you know say we have to go to the other room and talk about this anymore so i'll speak with it speak about it in front of family friends and you know they're getting to the point where you know, um, I think they know that I've actually done something productive in, in this. You know, it's an unusual hobby. I get it. Uh, it's a bit unorthodox, but uh, is it? Um, back in the day when most of the world's population, or at least the educated, uh, were, even the uneducated, were, you know, were biblically centered. Um, there's something I think, I think their very existence uh, affirms biblical narratives, and I, and I believe their very existence challenges the, the theory of evolution. I, I'm, I'm no longer sure that evolution is a thing. I think adaptation is a thing. Um, and we all adapt, innovate, and overcome according to the demands of our environment. So whether it be home life or work life or whatever, we adapt. We, we just move we, we're, we just have to be somewhat mercurial in, in your ability to, uh, you know, uh, blend in with certain environments, but the, this, uh, I don't know, I went off on a little tangent there. <laughs> now I've lost. Um, no, you're fine. You made a really uh, good point about evolution and adaptation. And, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm not convinced that, uh, you know, I, I'm more so convinced. You know, if evolution is a thing, these beings were around a lot longer than we were because we, if anything, or, or if it's the other way around, we have devolved. And I don't believe that we have uh, physically anatomically I, I just don't um, um I, I believe you know it, it's it's fodder for conversation for future conversation i'm not an expert i'm, I'm just I'm a, I'm a salesman i'm a i'm an artist uh i'm a sasquatch fan <laughs> yeah <laughs> even darwin political junkie you know yeah even darwin said in his book that none of this is concrete and has been scientifically proven and it's all a theory but they don't talk about that yeah, part okay. that he wrote down i didn't know that mm -hmm. yeah i'll bet and, you know, if, if these beings, I mean, they aren't, they speak and they speak with a tongue that is ancient, a tongue that is familiar and, and these other, you know, vocal modalities, the clicking, the melodic clicking and clucking. Uh, I've got three short clips that I'll send you that have, uh, all three have, um, they have conventional speech and the melodic clicking and clucking. Um, Clicks, clucks. Um, I'll send those to you, but you know that they, they're real. They exist. I mean, and the audio evidence I have is physical evidence. Uh, the totality of my evidence alone, uh, I think, is enough to have your most ardent skeptic, not the willfully ignorant, not those who are just you know in your face, and not those that are being uh, less than friendly or kind. Macho or know it all attitude. Yeah, you know, you know, grow up. You know, you really know nothing. 
Mm-hmm. Um, seriously, and I know nothing. I, I'm still I've been I've been reading the Bible. I'm formerly atheist too. I've been reading the Bible now for over twelve years, and, and between uh, at, recently it was four Bible studies. I'm you know not working right now. I got to add structure to my week, and I'm fascinated by the, the narratives of the Bible um, and insights into human nature, humanity itself. Um, it's very interesting. Uh, we've even, we've even had atheists in in uh, one of our Bible studies. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But you know, we welcome all. Yeah, uh, everybody the, changes. The Old Testament. Yeah, yeah, but the Old Testament narrative is like, wow, it seems like the answers are right here in this old book. That you know, it's not mm-hmm. things that we think are yeah. common day practices. Things that we came up with in our society are actually things that are pulled from the Bible and ancient history. Oh yeah, even medical yeah. practices. Yeah, and colloquial sayings. It's amazing how how often we come by these colloquial, you know, sayings, um, expressions that are biblically based. Oh yeah, and people. I think, didn't know that until I started reading. Yeah, people think, oh, germs is something that we discovered recently, and we know a lot about it now. Yeah. And people back then, they didn't really know they were all dirty. But if you look at like Leviticus and the Bible, they're talking about all that. You have to wash all your clothes. You have to clean yourself. And they talk about all these different diseases that. Yeah. are still practiced yeah. today and we still don't really know much about it today. I mean, they'll give you medications and stuff, but it won't really fix the problem, but it seems like it, they knew what was going on, you know, separate this person from the rest of the group and things like that. Right. Yeah. Like the lepers, <laughs> you don't want to live next to them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was for the good of society. You know, people say that may have been cruel, but yeah. Uh, Bathe yourself, wasn't. wash your hands and clean all your clothing you know, everything like that <laughs> that right. we still do today. Yeah. yeah. Well, even uh, eating uh, uh, certain meats with milk, I think with pork and milk, you don't want to do that. At least back in the day, you didn't. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, that makes sense. So if you find somebody, let's say somebody with my status or your status that believes in Bigfoot, and we dive into this pretty hardcore, if you find somebody that believes you, you know, a partner, would would you say keep that person around? Is it oh, hard? Oh, yeah. Hell, hell yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, Just for your own sanity's sake, you know? Yeah, it's probably hard to uh, find, like, let's say, oh, this person didn't work out. I'm going to move on to something new. It's probably hard to be like, oh, by the way, I believe in Bigfoot, and, ha- and have to do that every time you date somebody new. You know what I mean? <laughs> that, that's a tough well, it's one. It's funny because my wife, yeah, my, my wife said, because yeah, we met on Match.com, she said, if I knew you were in a big thing, I wasn't at the time. I could give a rip at the time, you know? But if she said, if I put that in my uh, in my dating profile, uh, she would never have, you know, which is a shame. You know, it's a darn shame. Uh, she's finally coming around. And, you know, I want mm-hmm. to talk to her about sexual things. And, and the sheer, I mean, I've, I've done some things that are not completely novel, but, you know, I've been able to repeatedly get... Uh, vocal expressions on on audio by re- going back to the same places time and again um you know I'm, the same tp from which i got uh recorded the chanting uh also recorded it's about a 52 second clip uh multiple subjects now i got the close quarter captures which i usually get when i you know leave the recorders in these structures i got some uh whistling and you can hear some speech and a little bit uh, the more furtive stuff, uh, the quiet, you know, more esoteric stuff. But you, in this capture, you have subjects throughout the valley seemingly communicating in a very civilized and, and, and sophisticated way. And it's not chaos. It's not what you would expect from a, uh, a you know, a, a clan of chimpanzees or, you know, going back and forth. They probably have their own language, but I'm, I don't know that it's decipherable to us. What I've captured here in that 52 second clip, I, I call it the Michigan Valley Voices. I recommend the audience listen to version 2.0. It's a, it's a little more uh, modulated, uh, uh, clarified, uh, developed uh, clip, and it reveals um, civil discourse going on among these ancient beings who are speaking with a variety of vocal modalities, including conventional speech. And you can hear that in Michigan Valley Voices version 2.0 it's super super cool yeah i appreciate you for sharing that with us james 
And do you think their language is somehow associated with the Native Americans and possibly the natives are associated with like the pre diluvian period with like the giants, you know, pre flood age? Yeah, I'd say I'm open to any of that. I can't say that that's not the case. I would think that's likely the case. Um, and, I, you know, there's two female voices that I captured along the uh, uh, Huron River in 2022, August of. Um, you'll get those clips and and uh, you will hear especially one of them sounds like a Native American uh, tongue. The other doesn't to me. And the other that didn't to me. I think is their own language and it's sort of reinforced by the fact that the melodic clicking and clucking immediately follows that expression. And that expression was the uh, uh, honey hop hoskin most to the east and to the ostra when the melodic clicking and clucking. The other vocal expression, which is either nine minutes before or the other one, but on the same footage, um, definitely sounds uh, First Nations. And that is that expression is honey awa, I will shig you one awa. It's beautiful. Uh, you can hear others in, in the background. You have to listen closely. There is the drone of a prop plane in the last bits of that uh, that clip, but uh, which is another interesting thing. When I hear planes go over, when they are engaged in, in, in you know communication, they seem to elevate their their volume a little bit in, in consonant with the you know introduction of the, the plane noise. It's a uh, pretty interesting phenomenon to to observe. Yeah, that is interesting. I heard a research group here in Missouri talk about how they can speak Abunaki, which I don't really know what that is. I think it's like an ancient Native American language. And I think one of the things they showed me or taught me was um, Ahu, Osigosu, which means hello, how are you, and Abunaki. Does that sound like anything nice. you've recorded, Ahu, Osigosu? That does not, not okay. that particular expression. Okay. Um, yeah, I was just trying to see if there's a correlation possibly, but man, it's hard to find patterns with these things or like for sure yeah, answers. Yeah. It's like once you think you know one thing, that leads to like a thousand more questions that lead to like a million yeah. more questions. And then next thing you know, yeah. you're kind of right back where you started. But I guess that that's the rabbit hole that we speak of. Yeah. Well, where I started, I'm not going to go back there because I, you know, these, I'm convinced there are people. Uh, I, I'm convinced uh, of, that they have a variety of vocal modalities. Um, I there is some uh, room for doubt in my recordings about what I'm actually because that that uh, sound that uh, sounds like a toilet flushing or the other demonic weird stuff that sounds absolutely demonic. Um, I, it's four times uh, four times I've recorded the expressions that sound exactly like Jesus Christ. Um, swear to God, and it's like so. I, I do believe. I don't know what that means. I don't know what to make of that. I mean, if one of these big, you know, beings is out in the woods and they turn a corner and there's someone, I, I, Jesus Christ would probably the, be the first thing that came out of my mouth. <laughs> you know, just out of out of sheer surprise, it's like oh. Uh, so maybe maybe that's maybe that's the origin of their, you know, utterance of, of what sounds like Jesus Christ. It's I don't know. There's, I, I don't have all the answers. It's it's a very very bizarre um, um, topic of, of study and nearly impossible to. to it will, will never be mastered. Uh, but from what I've found and with the success I've had capturing audio among the ver various river uh, drainage systems around Michigan, um, I'm convinced that there are different kinds. Uh, if they are of an angelic or demonic realm, maybe they have different roles. Um, I don't know. Uh, it's all speculation. And earlier I said I need to tickle both sides of my brain. This is like the perfect hobby to do it. And it's healthy. You know, get you outside, get you hiking. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's uh, I don't know. I, I listened to a little voice. I, this has been the greatest adventure of my life. Um, and I'm looking forward to more adventures in the future. Yeah, absolutely. I noticed that you mentioned you've heard like a toilet flushing on your audio recorder. I've had the same thing yeah. happen off the Merrimack River here in Missouri. I camped out there yeah. in an area where I had experiences at, and that's what it sounded like, like somebody flushed the toilet. Or wow. Like that or like comparable to like hitting a big metal drum or something. I was really thinking it sounded wow. like a toilet. It was weird. Well, I'll have to send you the t my 
toilet clip. It, and there's a voice that sounds like, it sounds like a jin jin joie. Uh, then this crazy, like a uh, chirping and then the toilet uh, flushing uh, sound. It's, it's, it's bizarre. And I don't know what to make of it. Uh, I did run into a woman who knew of the area where I, I claimed to have captured at the time. Uh, some Bigfoot audio. She goes, I don't believe in that, but I saw a dog man. It was running. It was a foggy night. Ran in front of a car. Uh, I know exactly the road, which is smack dab in the middle of the area that I explore. Um, and uh, she said she saw a dog man. So I said my earlier stuff. I may have. I may have dog man vocalizations. I don't know. And if that's the case, they are somewhat different from the Sasquatch vocalizations. Uh, but they they do share similar vocal modalities, that, like this harmonic resonance uh, description that I give it. Yeah, that is very interesting. And you make me want to go out and hang more audio. I kind of get burnt out after a while listening to so much audio, I, not get anything. And you just sit there and listen to all yeah. the white noise and the wind, yeah. and the bugs. I, and it's like, oh, man, there's nothing again. Yeah, yeah. Well, where are you leaving your recorders? Um, in areas Isn't where I've seen them, or... where I've had experiences at, where I find structures, and like you okay. said, like close to water and like that perfect habitat, but mainly in areas yeah. where I find structures and notice the activity. Okay. Yeah. Keep an eye on the structures and bug those structures. And when you find those that um, uh, are clearly like the teepees, wigwams, that kind of, that's where I'm, that's pretty much all, I, except for my encounter audio and audio captures right at the campsite all my uh, published stuff has have been captured um from the base of tp's wigwams and and uh, moon twos yeah um, a lot of stuff is by like highways and county uh -huh. roads yeah. so you'll hear like side by sides going by and big diesel trucks and it's like oh man not another one yeah <laughs> yeah and and they are they, they are that close and you still can pick up that you know some vocals Unfortunately, you have that the din of you know everyday human life uh, going on, uh, and that can be challenging at times. Um, I've also found that you know when it's raining, uh, I mentioned that 13-hour clip I had. It rained on and off most of that night, and uh, it's uh, I, you wonder. I, I don't know if the rain excites them or gets them moving. I, I do believe that they move in the rain. Maybe that's why uh, you know. Two out of the three recorded encounters at the camp I recorded it was raining. Um, I don't know. It's just a mystery. Yeah, maybe they know people aren't out in the rain, and that's when they decide to move around. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, that the the uh, the night of October twenty first, twenty nineteen. Uh, I was a Monday night. I moved my trip up. I was going to go Wednesday through the weekend, as I usually do. And uh, but a buddy's mom had passed away, and I wanted to make the, the wake on Friday, so I just moved my trip up and truncated it by one day. And uh, it was the first night uh, that there was it was raining, and that's when all that all the weird, the really weird uh, vocals that I recorded uh, outside the camp. It was that was it was raining. It, it makes you you hear speak some people speak of the elementals, and you know. Um, I know when it's raining, it provides more cover and concealment for them to move, and not a lot of you know we people are are out there. Um, so you know maybe it's just a matter a matter of circumstance that they're out and moving in in the in the, in the rain. I don't know, or they, maybe the rain enables them to exist. And if they are of an unseen realm, maybe the elements you know can shed a little light, if you will on uh, their ability to manifest in this in this dimension i had no idea i'm talking out of my ear <laughs> so uh, we just don't know yeah it uh, is called sasquatch theory so any theories yeah. are open to debate and um yeah i mean i feel like if they can go invisible turn into orbs whatever it may be that there's something going on behind the scenes whether it's like alien manipulation shapeshifters demons like there's got to be something that's truly going on that is going on behind the scenes yeah yeah it's beyond our ability to, to explain we gotta leave it to we they call us citizen scientists i guess uh <laughs> you know yeah. we're curious 
I don't know why the, the academic and the scientific establishment doesn't want to dig into this because the totality of the evidence. And, you know, when I first got into this, it was just my own wits and rec reckoning based on what was available on YouTube that led me to believe that they were, in fact, a re reality. So why, you know, why, where is the sense of adventure and imagination among the science, you know, communities and the academic communities? I, 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 I don't know where it is. I'm just like, come on, guys. And I welcome, I welcome any of those that consider themselves a member of the scientific or, or the academic community, or even the military community. Vet my stuff, bring it out. Anything I've published, uh, audio-wise. Uh, you know, bring it on. Tell me, tell me what this is. Um, you know, yeah. so what if it's recorded on MP3? <laughs> You're gonna criticize that? It's recorded. I mean, it's here. And I, you know, I document my my ingress and my egress when I drop off recorders. I don't. I seldom publish that stuff. But if anybody wants to call me on it, I say, well, here, here's here's the stuff. Um, you know, here's here's my evidence. Here's here's the proof. Uh, yeah, I, I want to get something better than Ron Moorhead. I want to get like that next Ron Moorhead audio clip and the next Patty footage. Yeah, wouldn't that be nice? Yeah, yeah, and it's gonna take it. You know, pray. You know what? I prayed on this whole journey, uh, and I, I I pray to be an instrument of His will. Right? So, uh, and believe me, if you if you look at the the sheer volumes of audio that I've captured over the past five years, uh, I have to say those those prayers have been answered. Uh, so, uh, just on the off, if you, you know, off chance there is supernatural and, and, uh, of the unseen realm, you know, it's not a, not a bad idea to throw a little prayer out there every once in a while. Yeah. I do the I same thing. Uh, the new realities. Yeah. You have to, you really do. Yeah. Like, you're you're taking a leap good. of faith going out there and just hoping for the best. So you kind of have to be spiritual or pray to god that something happens and it's just like anything else really in life yeah well the juvenile i remember having a conversation with god on the way up for, for that it was the latter half of uh, 2022 that when that juvenile woke me up i i i actually my ultimate goal miguel was to actually have a vocal actually a conversation with one of these beasts um with the little one that woke me up i mean it, it was a it was a vocal exchange it really wasn't a conversation <laughs> i yelled at it, it it did whatever it vocalized to me it sounded demonic um and uh, you know when i said hey get out of here that was that was it uh but i'd like a little next time i'd like a little more tit for tat and i had that opportunity with the big giant in uh, early in may of uh, 22 i just didn't do it i just chose to you know i think it was something i didn't realize was, was there and and uh, I just got back to one of the best night's sleep I've ever had up there. Yeah, that actually happened to me one time. I went out to investigate an active property in the Mark Twain National Forest, and the Sasquatch came up right when it got dark. And I was standing in front of a Sasquatch probably 15 or 20 feet for about an hour. He was in the wood line, wow. and I was in the yard. I couldn't see him, but they came up and they did these loud wood knocks and they were like dragging limbs through the woods, snapping sticks. And I was sitting there or I was standing there asking it questions. Can you do a wood knock? Pow. Can you push no over kid. a tree? Crack. I mean like the sound, like when you chainsaw a tree and you can hear it like crashing through the woods, it, it did all yeah. that. But I mean, it wasn't talking Amazing. to me. He wouldn't say anything back, but he would like respond with like wood knocks and tree breaks. It was, yeah. it was really yeah. cool. And I hear this and there's, you know, I can't, I can't poop through that whole mind speak thing. I just can't, uh, too many credible people have, have, uh, <laughs> have had that experience. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've never I'd heard like a to. voice, but like I said before with the spotlight story and the eyes went up, I've also had experiences where I think in my head while I'm out in the woods, huh? I haven't heard a wood knock all day. And then <laughs> perfect wood knock. It's like, wow, <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> Well, you know, in, in, if that's all real and manifest in reality, I mean, who are we to say that this whole God thing, you know, is is wrong? Too many people believe that it is wrong. I, you know, I I, I I believe they're connected. I really do. Yeah, they may be um, interdimensional beings, and there's other dimensions, other sides that we can't see beyond our 3D realm. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt about it. I witnessed something in the Catholic Church, and I'm not even Catholic. You know, it was it was a play of light that was just absolutely beautiful. But it was 
in the shape of a human. I thought it was the priest at first, um, but it was human shape in a hat. It moved and went away, and it moved in the way it moved before in, in another way, and then went away, and then it came back again. It moved in all the ways and had this energy to it, and it was just just an amazing experience um, that, that uh, I'll have to tell you about offline. It's not really uh, part of the subject matter, but uh, there are there is another realm. There's there's no doubt. And oftentimes it's unseen. Yeah. And if you want to share on here, that's fine. There's a lot of people who believe in God that listen to the channel. So it's up to you. Well, well, uh, I'll just give you the Cliff Notes version. A uh, buddy of mine's uh, father died, and I didn't know about it until another buddy called. And so I went, I went home. I was running around. I went home and got dressed and went out another 40 minutes away in Plymouth, Canton. It was Canton. It was Canton and uh to the catholic church and uh it's when the priest during my buddy's uh father's funeral uh, ceremony the priest was you know christ is born he, he was god you will come again or whatever it, it is exactly i don't know a brain card here <laughs> but it was during this uh thing that where the shadow appeared and it did appear it was like 15 feet beyond the, the back wall of the church it was about 15 feet maybe 20 probably less than 20 uh, from the priest, and he was doing his thing, and his shadow is what I saw. But the shadow moved on the back wall, moved to the left and to the right, which caught my attention because it was really weird. There's no light in the incense uh, uh, container or vessel that he's, he's waving. There's there's no light anywhere that, that would cast that shadow, and it went to the left and to the right. It was just weird, and then it went away. It came back during this ceremony of chant. That um, you know, it not only went left and right; it got larger and smaller, and then it went away again. This is over. I don't know how long it was. It was maybe a minute and a half, maybe two. I don't know. The third time it came back, it went. Through, it had those moments. It went left and right, and, and larger and smaller, and it had this energy about it, which was really. I, I, it was kind of to me. I, I was just curious at the time. Like, what am I witnessing? I, I just. I don't. I, I, I'm trying to make sense of it, and I'm a photographic artist, and there's no light source, and I'm like, I just, I'm scratching my head. It was just a weird experience, and uh, so uh, if I, it took me about a week to figure this out, but if I were to recreate those movements, I would have had a light source in front of the priest, and that light source would have been going to and from to get the larger and smaller. It would have been going side to side to get the you know side by side movement. I don't know what I could have done to, to get that light or that shadow, the, the energy that it had or this, you know, this vibrance that it had. But uh, the, those movements, in order to recreate that, those, that light phenomenon the shadow, on the back wall, the shadow, that, that light source would have been going in the shape of a cross, right? And I would have put that light source right where Chuck's father's casket was um that that to me was when i figured that out I was like oh my god that was so profound i'm not even catholic and my faith had been sealed at that time <sighs> so <laughs> it's really it's really uh an amazing thing to see yeah absolutely um this weekend we're gonna go camping down south where the eclipse is supposed to have the longest duration at and I'm wondering okay. if there's some type of connection. Maybe they'll be active when it happens, and maybe it has some I, type of um, biblical significance, which I'm sure it does, because when Christ died on the cross, there was an eclipse, on, I think, I, I do believe. Yeah, and the ground, the, the, there was an earthquake. You know, the, the, the earthquake it trembled, you know, it rumbled. Yeah. And it may, yeah, it's amazing. I wonder what's going to happen. I feel like we're... Well, good thing. I, I I hear people talking about CERN, too. I, I don't know much about CERN, but um, I've heard some interesting things about those who run the CERN program. It's uh, links to demonic. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of paganism stuff, so. and satanic worship yeah. that going on there. And I, I don't even know if the people know what they're doing. They're just ignorant and they're following along with these commercials and, um, I don't know, the symbolism. Yeah. Could be. I don't know. People are strange. You know, that's why I kind of, in 2016, I was thought the world had gone mad. I, I just went to the woods. And believe it or not, Bigfoot, quote-unquote, uh, this adventure has brought me more sanity 
than I ever anticipated, despite the insane things that happen along the way. Yeah, absolutely. I feel the same way. Um, life was pretty chaotic. And once I started doing this crazy Sasquatch thing, things make sense. I feel the best I've ever felt and I feel alive. I get out there and see the world, yeah. talk to all kinds of like-minded good people. And, um, I feel much more grounded than when I didn't believe or know about Sasquatch. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, a, a, a yeah, I feel the same way. And it's, I'm grateful for this journey despite the, you know, the pitfalls of it, you know, strange, the strange relationships and strange relationships. Um, but, uh, all you can do is keep on praying on it. And so far, my prayers have been answered. I'm, I've got happiness. That's all I ever wanted. I'm not a wealthy man, um, by any stretch. And, uh, my wife, uh, doesn't mind. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> yeah, that's good. And I hope yeah, that you capture yeah, yeah. that next Ron Moorhead audio well i hope you do i mean i think you know i uh, there needs to be a movement you know i mentioned nathan rio on he had the um um where go what was his he had this movement it's like go and see or project go and see uh has, yeah so you could you could do a hashtag project go and see and uh you'll come up with a lot of you know stuff that he may have very well had a hand in um so you know why not project go and listen i mean we we have this is like a crypto anthropologic uh or a crypto linguist anthropologic you know approach to learning about a culture of an ancient people or even a, a spiritual beings uh don't know but i think that the more people realize that this is a real phenomenon i think you know we have a and, and the, the narratives of the old testament are, are actually i think you know some people might say well Maybe we should, uh, you know, reconsider our perspective on on life and our view of the world, um, because there's a lot out there that is so profound and so significant, um, and so applies to the, uh, our existence here on Earth. That you know, I think people need to have a little, you know, heart and open mind to consider these things. And if you know, if all that's true, maybe we should listen to the Bible. You know. Yeah, absolutely. At least the Ten Commandments. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. And when is the next yeah. time you're going to go out to the forest to go camping or exploring? Well, uh, usually it's the first weekend in May. First or second, depends on, you know, a lot of things. Um, and I hope it's going to be the same this year. However, I have an interview Wednesday with an old boss that wants to bring me back into into her present operations. So. I think that would go well. I might have to move the trip up because I got to get to the woods. Uh, you know, it's been so warm here in Michigan. Uh, I really got the itch to to get out and do some do some camping. I got a brand new tarp I want to test out. Uh, new new tarp poles that will enhance my comfort there. And uh, there's always more vocal audio gems to be to be mined from the woods, if not from just outside my campsite. You know, you never know what's going to happen. And I'm uh, going back with a little trepidation. Uh, last year, I was encounter free, which I kind of needed after that experience with the juvenile wake, waking me up. Uh, but right now, I'm I'm thinking I'm ready for a little more uh, insane action, action. So long as I can come out of it when, uh, alive and not too not too uh, you know gut wrenched from the experience. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Ready for a little more, so. Yeah, so typically I go out twice a year. Sometimes, uh, you know, soon, uh, if I can, little weekend things, if I can get away with it. But it's not often. I'm, I'm busy. I'm a married guy, and I'm busy in the, with my church and the softball team, and I, and I sail in the summer with my father. And, and uh, you know, it's it's I got a good life, simple life, uh, but a blessed life, uh, no doubt about it. Yeah, no, I understand so, that. Okay. I somewhat limit my my uh the insanity you know <laughs> yeah no doubt do you have anything yeah. else you'd like to share or do we want to wrap things up uh not this time i'm so grateful for your time it's it's uh i don't know how long how long we've been on the phone my phone's in the other room but about uh, two this hours has been fun miguel yeah. oh wow hmm? well yeah. thank you thank yeah, you for it, this time it was uh, absolutely a good time clips off to you yeah, well, it's got nice to know someone out there is thinking along the lines. It's 
especially you know the the, the connections to the, the Bible. And, you know, you're you're a Jesus follower, and as am I. Uh, it's not a bad way to go. Not a bad way of life. But you know, these these mysteries uh, of this unseen realm and um, are really quite real. Yeah, no it's doubt. Just an amazing, profound epiphany. Uh, so, yeah, I think we're both blessed to uh, have had these experiences that we've had. Yeah. Okay. Well, I appreciate everything you've done today and for sharing well, your encounters you, and experiences, your finds, and just your theories in general. It really meant a lot to me. Hey, my pleasure. Peace be with you and your audience. And uh, if anybody cares to buy a T-shirt, I would be most grateful. Help ease the uh, financial burden of these interesting times we live in. So uh, if somebody has the ability, I'd, I'd, I'd appreciate the gesture. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the Michigan Aboriginal Project. Check them out. On Help YouTube, out. yeah. On YouTube, and yeah, you got a simply, website. Yeah, Michi- Michi- the website's simply michiganaboriginal.com. Uh, mm. There's an about page that essentially encapsulates uh, my current thinking of, of this subject in, in ways, I think, intellectually about, uh, about anybody. Uh, the concept that there are an ancient people living on, you know, living amongst us, literally, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, James. All right, brother. Yeah. Thank you. That wraps it up. And we'll follow up. I'll send you some clips and we'll uh, uh, carry on to the next chapter. Yep. That sounds good. Be sure to keep in touch. Hit me up on Facebook. Send me that audio and I'll tie it into the show. Will do, sir. Thank you, Miguel. All right. You be safe out there. and God bless, my friend. Likewise. All All right. right. God bless you. Mm. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. James, thank you once again for being a guest on the show, and I really appreciate you taking the time to share all your experiences, your research, your encounters with all of us, and it truly does mean a lot to me. James is a really kind person, and he was very patient with me. It took me a while to get this podcast out, so I really appreciate you, James, for um, not getting upset with me. Sometimes I get overloaded with work, and life gets in the way, so I apologize, guys. There's a lot of podcasts that I need to get out, and um, I have a huge list of podcasts that are just sitting there waiting to be edited. I've heard a lot of encounter stories and from a lot of people personally that Sasquatch likes to mess with people's tents at night and they wait until you are asleep until they approach you and that's pretty common with Bigfoot activity. I don't know what their fascination is. Actually my girlfriend was telling me a story. One of her friends was camping in Pisgah and late at night something tried unzipping the tent and whenever I went to Pisgah like I seen a lot of orbs and I don't think it was a natural phenomenon. I know scientists are researching the activity and they claim it's swamp gas, but I feel like the orbs are connected with the cryptids. And it's a strange thing to wrap your mind around, but it truly is happening. And for some reason, it's connected with the Sasquatch. I hope everyone listening enjoyed this podcast and hopefully you guys come back for more. I really appreciate the support. And if you have a Bigfoot encounter that you would like to share with me, please contact me at sasquatchtheory at outlook.com. Thank you everyone for tuning in and listening today. God bless everyone and be safe out there in the woods.